Welcome to the online training, Reset Methodology. My name is Steve. This presentation consists of three main sections. In the first section, I will review resets in general. Next, I will go over when resets should be used. I will then go over reset circuitries. And of course, all the sections will be focusing on Intel FPGA hardware with emphasis on Hyperflex architecture. On the next number of slides, you will see some Verilog and VHDL examples on inferring registers, and this is only for a refresher. At the very top is a way to create an initial condition for a register by assigning the declaration of the signal to a value. Beneath that is the inference of a simple register, and then to the right, inferring a register with a synchronous reset and an asynchronous reset. We have the same register inference in the VHDL code, with the initialization taking place when the signal is declared, then the inference of a simple register beneath that, and then to the right, a synchronous reset register. And this slide just barely shows the inference of an asynchronous reset register. Hyperregisters are simple D flip-flops in the routing infrastructure in FPGAs built with the Hyperflex architecture technology. The hyperretimer is a stage of the fitting process that runs after the router and moves ALM registers into hyperregister locations. Since hyperregisters do not have any control signals, the hyperretimer has the greatest flexibility using the hyperregisters when there are no control signals on the registers. So, the hyperretimer cannot use hyperregisters when the registers have asynchronous resets. The hyperretimer can bypass the LM register to use the first hyperregister after the LM if there is a synchronous reset by using the SCLR circuitry. The functionality of hyperregister is equivalent to original ALM register in this case. But using the synchronous reset in this case is limited only to this scenario. So the hyperretimer is still limited, even in this case of synchronous resets. The Design Assistant Rule Settings is a Cordis feature that has been around for a while. This feature is accessed through the menu selection in Cordis using the Assignments, Settings, Design Assistant Rule Settings pull-down menu. The screenshot shown here will evaluate your design on hyperretimer readiness, which determines how easily the hyperretimer will be able to work with the registers in your design. Here are some general guidelines on when you should consider using resets and when you should not. If your design does not absolutely need the reset, then consider not having a reset and resort to valid signals, for example, on data buses. In general, if your resets are not causing problems, don't be overly concerned with fixing them. When dealing with the asynchronous clears and resets on the registers, Timing Analyzer reports on the recovery and removal times. The recovery time is the amount of time before the rising edge of the clock that the reset has to be deasserted in order for the value of the flip-flop to be stable. The recovery time is analogous to the setup time. The removal time is the amount of time after the clock edge that the deassertion has to wait in order for the value of the flip-flop to be stable. As a reminder, the recovery and removal sub-reports are found in Timing Analyzer and should be checked as part of your normal timing closure procedure. The diagram shown here is a method of synchronizing an asynchronous reset to your clock domain. In this diagram, I have two clock domains, clock A and clock B, but with a single reset signal. This circuit is a synchronizer that uses the VCC as inputs to the V-pins. The tools automatically detect the circuit as a synchronizer and as such tries to place the second flip-flop as close to the first flip-flop as possible, giving the most amount of time or slack for the signal coming from the Q-pin of the first flip-flop to the D-pin of the second flip-flop to mitigate as much as possible for metastability. Since the asynchronous reset coming in is asynchronous, this path should have a false path SCC command placed on it so that Timing Analyzer will not try to analyze this path and Timing Analyzer will analyze the Q to D paths to tell you if timing was met. Here's a little bit more of an elaboration of the Reset Synchronizer, showing how you can stack up your synchronizer circuits if one portion of the design relies on another part of the design to be reset first. You now find yourself needing to modify your design to give you the same reset scenario. 
So how do you determine if the design naturally resets? Well, you must ensure that the modified design can reach the same steady state reset condition as the original circuit when the reset is asserted long enough. The diagrams on this slide show an example. On the left is the original circuit with an AC gross reset connected to all of the registers. When the reset is asserted, all the registers are driven to zero, regardless of their current value and remain so until released. So the steady state reset condition is all registers are at zero. On the right, we have the circuit with all the resets removed except for the first and the last register. We also have the reset input tied to a reset shift register chain. When a reset occurs, the reset shift register chain is sufficiently long enough to assert the reset to the first register for however many cycles necessary, allowing for the reset to propagate all the way through the design. During this time, the last register is held in reset directly. This protects the outputs so that while the pipeline is clearing out, the downstream logic will not see spurious data values or glitches. Thus, holding the reset asserted, we can achieve the same steady state reset condition as the original circuit. Another option is to employ a counter to generate a reset pulse. This is in lieu of the reset shift register chain that we saw in the previous slide. Here, the counter is designed to hold the first register's reset long enough for the zeros to propagate all the way through the pipeline. While either synchronous or asynchronous resets would be fine for the first register in this case, we would still recommend synchronous clear unless you have a specific need for an immediate asynchronous reset of the first register. Note there are other techniques for removing asynchronous clears that are possible which you may want to investigate as they may be more feasible depending on your design behavior. You can also pipeline the reset signals so that the hyper-retimer can take full advantage of the hyper-registers to achieve a more balanced timing delay as the reset signal propagates through the design. While the pipeline circuit on this page does show balanced pipelining, just be aware that it does depend on your design's reset needs as to how you will pipeline your reset structure. When you manually create duplicates, the synthesis tools has the ability to merge duplicate logic in order to reduce the logic usage. When you create these types of logic structures, like what we saw on the previous page, you want to ensure that the logic remains. To do so, you can place the listed synthesis only attributes so that the synthesis tool will not merge the logic. You want to be sure that it is synthesis only attributes in this case so that the hyper timer is free to optimize the registers as it sees fit. In addition to manually duplicating registers, the fitter has an algorithm to duplicate registers as well. What does the algorithm try to automatically do? The fitter will duplicate any register that has more than 1,000 fanouts early in placement decided by early estimates of physical proximity. But for asynchronous fanouts, the algorithm leaves all asynchronous fanouts on the original register and duplicates the synchronous fanouts only. So in other words, it doesn't help recovery time, it only optimizes for setup. The user has some control over this algorithm by using the duplicate register assignment. The assignment is good to nudge the tools in the direction you want if the fanout is less than 1000. You can find information in the fitter duplication summary report. There is another assignment that you could use to help with fanout issues. This is the duplicate hierarchy depth. The registers in the chain must satisfy all of the conditions to be included in the duplication. Registers must be fed only by another register. Registers must not be fed by combinational logic. Registers must not be part of a synchronizer chain. They must not have any secondary signals. They must not have a preserve attribute or a preserve register assignment. All registers in the chain, except the last one, must only have one fan out. So what does the algorithm try to do uh, automatically? Any registers that have more than 10,000 fan outs late in the synthesis process will be pushed and replicated accordingly. You can find the report information in the Hierarchical Tree Duplication Summary and Hierarchical Tree Duplication Details. In the HyperFlex architecture FPGAs, there is the idea of a C-cycle equivalent circuitry. This is the number of cycles required after power-up to get the same reset condition after retiming. Looking at the top circuit, we see that an initial condition of zero on R1 means that the two branches will also have an initial condition of zero. 
This concept is separate from the power on condition. When the read timer moves the registers and duplicates them, there is a chance that the initial condition will be different than the original circuit given, a potential don't care condition on the hyper registers, so each branch can have a different value. As a result, in this example, you have to wait for additional two clock cycles to achieve the same initial condition as the original circuit. This C cycle equivalency is reported as the first reset sequence requirement, meaning that this is the number of additional clock cycles that the reset has to be held to achieve the equivalent circuit. Hyper registers and ALM registers have programmable power up or initial conditions. The register can power up to 1 as originally intended before retiming was performed. The read timer will have more difficult time retiming registers if initial power on conditions are enabled. Here's an example of where initial condition can prevent retiming. Here we have a signal that fans out to multiple registers, some through inverters. All registers power up low, so all the downstream logic driven by the circuit sees zero outputs. If the hyper timer wants to retime the bottom register backwards through the diverging point, then all paths must provide a register. But if this retiming move is performed and all outputs must retain their initial value of zero, what initial value of the register can be programmed that would allow this to happen? With the inverted and non-inverted paths, this is impossible. So, this register cannot support this retiming move. If you must rely on initial conditions and your system requires that all registers start synchronously, you must use clock gating. Because hyper registers lack a reset or enable signal, you cannot initialize them to a specific value using a reset control signal. The initial condition of your design at power up represents the state of the design at clock cycle zero. The initial condition is highly dependent on the underlying device technology. Once the design leaves the initial state, there is no automated method to return to that state. In other words, the initial condition state is a transitional rather than functional state. In addition, other design components can affect the validity of the initial state. For example, a PLL that is not yet locked upon power-up can impact the initial state. Therefore, do not rely on initial conditions when designing for HyperFlex architecture FPGAs. Rather, use a single reset signal to place the design in a known functional state until all the interfaces have powered up, locked, and trained. Independent signals drive the eternal clock controls of ALM registers and hyper registers in the Intel HyperFlex architecture FPGAs. During the configuration process, the registers become active row by row as opposed to device wide. ALM register clocks can potentially enable independently from hyper register clocks. If the design clock is free running, this can cause potential race conditions between rows and between ALM registers and hyper registers. These conditions can result in potential overwrite of initial conditions. It is recommended to not rely on initial conditions of the registers in the FPGA to represent an initial functional state. Furthermore, to give the hyper retirement the greatest flexibility, you could turn off the power up initialization and rely on a properly designed reset network for your initial functional state. Intel Stratix 10 devices use a parallel sector based architecture that distributes the core fabric logic across multiple sectors. Device configuration proceeds in parallel with each local sector manager configuring its own sector. Consequently, Intel Stratix 10 registers and core logic are not released from reset at exactly the same time as has always been the case in previous families. The continual increases in clock frequency, device size, and design complexity now necessitates a well thought out reset strategy that considers the possible effects of slight differences in the release from reset. This reset strategy must hold the device in reset until all registers and core logic are in user mode. I strongly recommend that you use the and then it done output of the reset release Intel Stratix 10 FPGA IP as one of the initial inputs to your reset circuit. 
Xpropagation is a method of finding registers with missing resets or design susceptibility to undefined power up values. For example, control logic, such as a counter or state machine requiring a reset to force it to a known value. Or if the reset has been mistakenly omitted from such constructs, there is the possibility of them powering up to an undefined state from which they may never recover. Xpropagation in RTL simulation can be challenging due to limitations in the flow, such as lack of support for certain data types. Xpropagation in gate level simulation bypasses these data type limitations as it uses standard HTL structures used in generated netlist. Xpropagation is used to initialize registers to an unknown or an X value in the simulation netlist rather than a 1 or a 0. If all registers are sufficiently reset or designed to flush out to a known state, then the initial X's will flush through the design and will be overwritten with the known predefined value. If there is insufficient reset logic, such as in a counter or state machine, then the X's will be maintained through the feedback loop and will never be overwritten, causing the simulation to fail. Xpropagation gate level simulation should be adopted as a standard verification step for all generated core IP blocks. Catching such cases in simulation could help avoid seeing these issues in hardware, which would be far more difficult to debug. This slide illustrates an example of the necessity of properly simulating Xpropagation. The Verilog and VHDL code are functionally equivalent. There's an else if condition that checks for one logic value. If something other than a logic 1 comes through, such as a 0 or an x, then q gets a. For proper x propagation to happen, the q signal should get an x when there is an x on the input. Propagating an x through your design makes testing your reset network, as you can see in the simulation all the red waveforms where the x is propagating through. This slide is a simulation of a 5-fold circuit. Notice that the A clear signal is initially deasserted, and as a result, there are X values on the outputs. When the A clear is asserted and then deasserted, the FIFO outputs go to a known state. X propagation simulation facilitates the testing of the reset network in your design. Implementing the reset techniques discussed in this presentation will allow you to properly design the reset tree for different clock domains, employing strategies to manage high fanout and ensure that your design will be in the expected state. Refer to the various resource items listed here if you are interested in learning more about the various topics that I covered in this training. Here is a flowchart of the curriculum of some of the classes that Intel has to offer, which include introductory classes, follow-on classes, and some more specialized classes. To find courses that are available, go to intel.com and enter a training program in the Search Data Entry field. If you require technical support on your Intel FPGA solution, please feel free to make use of the support options shown on this slide. One last thing, when you registered for this training, a link was sent to you in your confirmation email that links to a short online survey. Please complete the survey to let us know what you think of this training and if you can think of ways in which it can be improved. Thank you.